Welcome, everyone, to Family Talk. It's a ministry of the James Dobson Family Institute, supported by listeners just like you. I'm Dr. James Dobson, and I'm thrilled that you've joined us. Hello, everyone. I'm Roger Marsh, and this is Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We have an insightful program for you today, but I have one small caution before we get started. The content discussed in this broadcast is intended for mature audiences, and it may not be suitable for younger listeners. So if you have kids listening in with you right now, parental discretion is advised. Okay, with that warning, let's get into our topic right now. In the Garden of Eden, God created the institution of marriage between one man and one woman. And husbands and wives truly become one flesh through the experience of physical intimacy. Sex was designed by God to be exclusively reserved for the marital relationship. However, as we'll learn through this broadcast, that divine purpose has been wildly disregarded by culture. Today we're reaching into our audio vault to revisit Dr. Dobson's conversation with Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner. The Penners are sex therapists and relationship experts who have years of experience helping heal and guide marriages. On this occasion, they identified the societal threats to intimacy and described the characteristics of a God-honoring relationship. There's a lot of content to get to, so let's begin. Here now is Dr. James Dobson to introduce his guest on this classic edition of Family Talk. Today we're going to be specifically talking about the sexual aspect of marriage, uh, the very precious and intimate union that God designed only to be shared by one man and one woman in the context of marriage. And to help us do that today, we have two highly qualified individuals, uh, husband and wife team. Uh, Their names are Dr. Clifford and Mrs. Joyce Penner. Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner are an internationally recognized sex therapist, educators, and authors. Joyce is a clinical nurse specialist, holds a master's degree in psychosomatic nursing from UCLA, and until recently was uh, associate pastor of Congregational Life at Lake Avenue Congregational Church in Pasadena, California, where we used to live. Uh, Dr. Penner is a clinical psychologist. He earned a master's degree in theology from Fuller Theological Seminary and holds a Ph.D. from Fuller's Graduate School of Psychology. The Penners have authored nine books, including The Gift of Sex, Restoring the Pleasure, and Getting Your Sex Life Off to a Great Start. In addition to conducting sex education and sexual enhancement seminars, the Penners specialize in sexual therapy at their clinic. The title of the book is The Married Guy's Guide to Great Sex, Building a Passionate, Intimate, and fun love life. That's mm-hmm. the goal, isn't it? Yeah, that's, that's for right. sure. Uh, you all have been working in this field for 30 years. I don't know anybody in the country that's uh, more knowledgeable or better qualified in this area than you all are. Let's start with a kind of a cultural checkup. Uh, what has changed in 30 years? Obviously, we are a much more eroticized society now than we were then. Uh, I mean, it's everywhere from Abercrombie and Fitch to the television, radio, books, films. I mean, it's absolutely everywhere. Has that resulted in greater spontaneity and greater passion in the bedroom? Unfortunately not. And because uh, the emphasis is on the erotic rather than on the intimacy. And so the expectations are that it will happen like we see in our culture when a couple gets married. And what we find is that the attraction of a new relationship that creates the passion, that that initial hype of newness dissipates in about 6 to 30 months. And if we don't make the transfer into an intimate, deep connection with our spouse, then that passion dies. And then the couple will think, Well, you know, I married the wrong person. I'm just not in love anymore. And it doesn't have to do with love. It has to do with not being able to connect intimately at a deep level. When we combine the erotic with the intimate, then we have a a sexual life that can be celebrated over a lifetime. Yeah. 
then is it safe to say that there are more people who have a sexual dysfunction now than 20, 30 years ago when you started? Especially younger couples start out with more disappointment. They're, because they come with an expectation yeah. that it's going to be like it is in the movies or like they imagined it uh, from whatever material has come their way. And uh, in fact, it isn't that way, whereas in the past we didn't have that setup of expectations. Well, it, it's not all fantasy. You indicate in the book, this was a shock to me. I thought I knew the statistics that only 20% of the people who get married are virgins. And probably mm. less than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The politically correct belief at this point is that a young couple should go ahead and experience uh, a sexual relationship before marriage so that they know what they're doing. Yeah, it the does old, not you, work that way. You'd does. never buy a car without doing a test yeah. drive, that argument. You know, I was about 13 years old when a 14-year-old boy told me that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He said, you really, people really ought to live together because then it's like trying out a shoe. Mm -hmm. you yeah. find, can you imagine this? That mm -hmm. was my early <laughs> sexual <laughs> training. <laughs> yeah. I never forgot his advice, although I didn't accept it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But that is uh, what's often believed, isn't yes. it? Yes. And it doesn't work because premarital sex is different than married sex. And many couples have difficulty transferring that premarital passion into their marriage because of our cultural expectations. And there's a 50% greater chance of the marriage breaking up within five years if the couple has lived together before. Mm -hmm. It's a bad idea, but it's a very common one now. Very well, common. and still widely accepted in the culture even after that statistic came out. Mm -hmm. uh, what was God's original design for marriage? What do you think he had in mind when he gave us this gift? The model as we see it, and this is why people over the centuries have compared the Song of Solomon to our relationship with Christ, because there is a lot of parallel. For the woman, it doesn't start with a sexual approach. It starts with an emotional, relational sure one. Sure does. Yeah. And then that opens her up sexually. But many times men feel incredible pressure, particularly when sex isn't going well in the married relationship, because they feel like somehow they should be getting her to respond. They should be making it work. And so the pressure is in the wrong way. The pressure is on, and then she feels pressure because he's putting pressure on her. Especially today. Yes. When it is so open, there's no modesty. No. When Things that are on television uh, should embarrass us if mm -hmm. they don't. And uh, MTV for kids begins talking about these uh, embarrassing aspects of our sexual nature. And when you see all that and hear all that, performance becomes more important. You begin to feel you've got to uh, do what you've seen others do. And it becomes so goal-oriented rather than that relationship oriented and it gets focused on measuring how well we're doing and watching and and spectatoring and well, all you that see pressure. that's what we as men do so naturally because we almost inevitably want to win we want to achieve our goal conquer and, conquer mm -hmm. in fact if you think about it in genesis when when god kicked adam and eve out of the garden he said to to adam you have to go out and till the fields. In other words, you got to do something out there. And the first thing he says to Eve is, and your desire shall be for your husband, which is a very relational thing. Yeah. And uh, it it's, was there way back then already, and that's still true today. Uh, Cliff, as a psychologist, isn't that amazing that you mm -hmm. find in those early scriptures the uh, nature of mankind and womankind uh, that is spelled out for us there. Uh, what was it? 5,000 years ago, at least. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah, and we see it lived out today. And so when men apply their goal-oriented approach to the sexual relationship, where they're trying to achieve something or mm. get somewhere or accomplish something, rather than an experience of a relationship... It never yeah. works. So when you're doing uh, sex therapy with these couples, one of your first objectives is to get them to think in terms of relationships rather than 
achievement, conquering, uh, yes. accomplishment. accomplishment. Yes. Exactly. Yes. That's why we address the married guy's guide first, because that's a tough shift for a lot of men to make. Because in every other area, sports or games or work or anything else, we're supposed to accomplish the goal. Mm. Do you find when men come in to talk about these kind of problems, they find it very difficult to open up and be honest? I mean, there's masculine pride all over this subject, isn't there? Well, many times it's the woman who comes or she will bring her husband, yeah. even though he's the one because he's hesitant to come. And, and then so you're gets, absolutely right. It's difficult for them. In fact, we find at seminars that you would think when you had a sex seminar at the church that all the men would sign up, say, yeah, that's what I want. But men don't want to talk about it. They just want to do it. <laughs> and uh, and so, so it's always the woman dragging the man to the seminar, ah, which is a hmm. rather fascinating thing. We, we were it. talking about the culture again. I want to go back uh, to that because I'm so concerned about uh, uh, pornography and what it's doing mm -hmm. to us. Uh, especially internet pornography, which is so available. Uh, you know, uh, uh, people in respectable jobs uh, would have to go to a uh, an adult bookstore and hope nobody saw them in the past and bring out uh, a product in a brown paper bag. Now they just turn on that computer and there they are. There it is. And so many people are getting hooked on it. Is that what you're hearing? Oh, massively. I mean, we could fill our practice with just people who are sexually addicted to the Internet. It is that great. And we're talking in all levels of life, all levels of education, Christian, non-Christian, uh, it's just happening everywhere. And men tend to get addicted to the pornography, but women are getting addicted to the chat mm. lines mm. Ah. and the relationship aspect. See, and that makes sense if you think about it. Sure. We as men are oriented toward what the we visual. get, get mm -hmm. visually, and women are oriented to the relational. Yeah. And so that's where they get hooked. And it so counters intimacy. It so counters what the man is really looking for. It always promises to fulfill, but it doesn't. Uh, you said in your book that in 30 years of uh, being sex therapist, you have never met a woman who was attracted to pornography per se. Let's be very clear about that. We do not have experience with any woman who was addicted to it. We know lots of women who have used it along the way and even been attracted to it. But the addictive quality that yes. we see in men where they'll spend two, four, six, eight, twelve hours at a stretch on it, we don't see in women. But we see that happening with them on the chat lines. And that's one of the things that's changed dramatically since you started. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, when we were with you 21 years ago, there wasn't an internet. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, it, you did have to go to the sleazy part of town. Um, and we would have said at that time that all sexual addictions began between ages 8 and 14. And that is mostly true, but with the internet pornography, we find adults getting addicted at any age. When they have not evidenced any addictive patterns, any obvious addictive patterns in their earlier years. You know, there are many people, I fear, um, husbands and wives, who use pornography to spice up their relationship, uh, to generate something that's been lost, and to, uh, you know, get them uh, back into a sexual frame of mind. Why does that not work? And that's interesting because that's a common question that we get. You know, why can't we watch pornography together as a couple? It gets us great sex afterwards. What's wrong with it? And it's interesting because the secular research shows that couples who watch pornography together may have a much more exciting sexual experience right after they watch. But with time, they need more and more input for that to happen more explicit, yes. more involved, That's and it. they lose their ability to, to get turned on to each other. So they get yeah. further and further apart yeah. because they're focused out rather than on each other. They're into mm. fantasy. Yeah. That's right. And there's nothing in reality that can compete with fantasy Exactly. when it comes right down to it. And what you mentioned, Joyce, when I was on the uh, Pornography Commission, uh, mm -hmm. that progressive nature of mm -hmm. pornography is something people don't count on. Right. I mean, what 
stimulate you today will not be enough tomorrow. That's right. And that will not be enough the next day. And it walks you down the road toward harder and harder, more violent, more perverse uh, activity in order to get the same stimulation. It's not unlike heroin. One little pill or one little uh, shot. shot, you know, is uh, is tremendously exciting, but it won't be enough a month from now. You'll need more and more and more until it destroys you. And uh, that's what it does to a relationship. And and furthermore, I hear I'm talking like the expert. You guys are the expert, <laughs> but, but I've been there. I'm, you're the expert that, on the uh, pornography. Yeah. Pornography commission. But also the women um, don't want to do what the guy sees in the pornography. And he demands things of her that are offensive to her. And it becomes a barrier. Well, let's not talk about that in a minute. Yes. Because, That's a whole other issue. Because what the man sees on the pornography, whatever form he gets that in, um, what he likes about that is that the woman always does whatever he wants. He gets whatever his fantasy is because yes. he can pick and choose from, you know, 150 million choices. And, and she never asks anything of him. Uh, so it is a total non-intimate, one-sided event. And they always behave as if they're loving it. Yeah. That's the whole idea of pornography. And so um, it can't ever be translated back into the bedroom in a committed relationship. But men do then come to the married relationship and want the wife to dress that way. They want her to behave that way. They want to do the activities they saw in pornography. And she is many times trying to go along with that, but feels offended, feels Used. violated, she used. Feels used. She right. feels like she's an object yeah. rather than, again, it isn't connecting the erotic with the intimacy. And he is not making love to her. He's making love to that image. That's right. Uh, that he has seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wish everybody believed that. Do you attempt to treat uh, pornography addictions? We do. Oh, all the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. Mm -hmm. All the time. How successfully? If we can get people to acknowledge that it is indeed an addiction, get them to cop for more than they were busted for. You see, usually somebody doesn't come in until the wife checks out the History Channel, walks in on him, comes home when she uh, wasn't expected to come home. Something comes up. It is very rare that a man will come and say, I've just realized I need to stop this. That's happened every now and then, but very rarely. Most of the time it's when they get busted, but when they are willing to acknowledge the extent of their habit and then commit to somebody who will be, they will be accountable to and recognize that this is going to be something they will have a tendency to slip into for the rest of their life unless they are vigilant and diligent. And then that's the one side. Then on the other yes. side, we also have to work on building the intimacy in their marriage because you see a sexual addiction usually is a result of somebody who has not developed that intimacy in their marriage. So we can't just cut out the addiction. We've got to replace it yeah. with something You're really on marriage the counselors. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. The sex is just a part of a much bigger picture. Right. And yeah. we guide them through our book, Restoring the Pleasure, which is starts with kind of all over in building. How do you connect with someone physically, emotionally, and spiritually? How right. do you well, how, bring How about that? You were talking to men yeah. right now. Yeah. Uh, fewer men write to us, but they're out there. And right. I meet them on the street. Yes. I know they're there. Yes. Truck right. drivers and, and physicians and a lot of people are out there. Uh, suppose that such a man is sitting in front of you and he says, I really want to connect with my wife. I really want to love her the way God intended. I know this is right. And I know that our sex life has been lacking mm -hmm. and it has not been meaningful to either one of us, uh, even though we go through the motions. Uh, where do I start? How do I get an understanding of what she needs from me? I'm a man. I don't understand Women, I don't even understand my own wife. Where do you start? <laughs> That's great. And uh, what we would encourage them to do is to take a book like The Married Guy's Guide to Great Sex and read it out loud together. And then she can say, yes, that's exactly it. Or, you know, that isn't quite me. And he can say, you know, I don't think that's true about men. And she can say, well, 
I think it is. <laughs> and that's because often the see, way it goes. A lot of times, couples, if you just sat them down and said, okay, now start talking about your sex life, it's a great silence because they don't know what to talk about. That's they don't know why, where to start. That's, yeah, that's why part we, of the problem. Yeah. yeah that's yeah. why we have them read out loud together, and then they've got something to bounce off of with each other so that they can begin to get into the experience of discovering where the other person is and what their needs are. And then we recommend to couples that they spend 15 minutes a day together. And this isn't having sex. This is just connecting. And we have a little formula that, and during that 15 minutes, they spend some time just, you know, face-to-face intimacy, just talking about where you are, how was your day, what happened, and then maybe read a Bible verse together, some scripture, a couple's devotional, pray, and 30 seconds or less or more of passionate kissing. But we believe that if couples kissed passionately every day and had some way to connect with each other and had some kind of prayer together, spiritual time, that this difference would start to happen. We doubt that many couples would get divorced if they could do that together. 15 minutes a day sounds like very little, and we're all for an hour a day. But for most couples, 15 minutes a day of face-to-face contact would be a new experience. Not talking about sex. Not talking about sex. Not talking about who's going to pick up the laundry or who's going to take the kids to their lessons or anything like that. Just kind of where they are, what they're feeling, where their heart is. Because so many couples over the years stop kissing passionately. And the reason they stop kissing is because the wife will think before she'll kiss passionately. She'll say, okay, now, if I kiss passionately, I know he's going to want to have sex. So I've got to be sure I really want to have sex before I kiss. And eventually, they're not kissing very often. And they're not kissing very passionately. And we believe it's the connection and kissing passionately that keeps the pilot light on. This uh, half hour has gone by in a big hurry, and uh, all we have time left uh, for is to say goodbye. Uh, Dr. Cliff and Joyce Penner, uh, great friends to Shirley and me for many years, uh, at least 30, I guess. I think so. I think so, yes. And I appreciate what you all are doing. Thank you for taking the time away from your practice to come over here to uh, Colorado and be with us. And there's a whole lot more uh, for us to cover here. Romance and connecting with your husband or wife is about far more than just sex. You can take your marriage to a whole new level when you faithfully follow what God's Word says about intimacy. If you found value in today's program with Dr. James Dobson and his guests, Dr. Clifford and Joyce Penner, be sure to join us again tomorrow for part two of this essential conversation here on Family Talk. In the meantime, you can learn more about the Penners and their therapy work when you visit our website at drjamesdobson.org forward slash family talk. Now, if you're looking for a way to connect with your spouse and to grow closer to God in your marriage, I encourage you to sign up for our 10-day marriage series. Simply visit drjamesdobson.org forward slash 10-day marriage series. You'll be directed to input your email address and then click on the sign up button. Starting with the day you sign up and then for the next 10 days, you'll receive an encouraging email from Dr. James Dobson about how to strengthen your marriage. Each email includes some words of wisdom from Dr. Dobson and some questions for you and your spouse to answer, as well as a prayer to say together. All marriages require intention, dedication, and hard work to realize the gifts that God intended for marriage. And it's our prayer for you that you will become even closer with the Lord and with each other after you go through this series. Again, go to drjamesdobson.org forward slash 10 day marriage series. Thanks for remembering that Family Talk is a listener-supported ministry, and we enjoy hearing from you and getting to know you. We encourage you to reach out with your comments, questions, and especially your prayer requests. Remember, you can reach our customer care team by phone when you call 877-732-6825. That's 877-732-6825. Of course, if you'd like to reach us through the mail, our ministry mailing address is the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, P.O. Box 39000, Colorado Springs, Colorado, the zip code 80949. Once again, our ministry mailing address is the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute, or JDFI for short. 
P.O. Box 39000, Colorado Springs, Colorado, the zip code 80949. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks so much for listening today to Family Talk, the voice you trust for the family you love. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute. Hey everyone, Roger Marsh here. When you think about your family and where they will be when you're no longer living, are you worried? Are you confident? Are you hopeful? What kind of legacy are you leaving for your children and their children? Here at Family Talk, we're committed to helping you understand the legacy that you're leaving for your family. Join us today at drjamesdobson.org for helpful insights, tips, and advice from Dr. James Dobson himself. And remember, your legacy matters.